In this video, we're just going to continue applying several math strategies to simplify rational expressions. So just as a quick warm up here, I just want to talk about adding and subtracting fractions. Uh, just remember that you can't add or subtract fractions unless you have a common denominator. So you can see here I've got a common denominator of 9. So I should have no issue just simply performing the operations straight across in my, in my numerators. And you'll see that I get 3 over 9. Okay, and it's always good practice just to reduce your fractions to lowest terms. I can divide the top and bottom by 3 and end up with one third. Okay, but what happens when you don't have a common denominator? So you can see here, I've got six and four, not common, so I cannot simply just add straight across. You have to take a look at your denominators, and your goal is to come up with the lowest common denominator between these two numbers. So if you think about the multiples of six, and you just think about them in your head, think about the multiples of four, you'll see that the lowest common multiple would be 24. So your goal here is to make the denominator of each of these fractions 24. And we do that by multiplying. So think about what can I multiply 6 by to get 24? And the answer should come to you fairly quickly. It should be 4. So we're going to multiply both the top and bottom by 4. The reason for that is if I cancel out these 4s, I end up with my original fraction. So I haven't actually changed my expression here. Okay, and I'm going to do the same thing for 1 over 4, except I'm going to multiply by 6 over 6. Okay, that should give me 24 on the bottom. Okay, so I end up with two new fractions that are equivalent to my original two fractions. You can see they now have a common denominator of 24. So I can now add straight across and reduce my fraction to lowest terms. The concepts in this video are really just based around this idea of finding common denominators for fractions. Rational expressions with a common denominator can be added or subtracted in the same way as fractions with a common denominator. So pretty much what that says is that if you have some rational expressions and they have a common denominator, just treat them like fractions. So this, this problem here is actually exactly the same as this problem here. I know they don't look the same, but we can treat them the same. So because these guys have a common denominator, I can just simply perform the operation that I'm being asked to perform. So I can just take 2x, I can add 3, I can add 4x minus 1. Right? Because I've got a common denominator, I don't need to change my denominator in any way. I can just add straight across, keeping my denominator the same. And next thing you need to do is just collect your like terms. So I've got a 2x here, a 4x here. I've got a 3 and a negative 1. So I can just collect those nicely. Okay, and just a reminder about restrictions. It's always good practice just to state any values that might make this expression invalid. So if I were to sub in 0 for x, yeah, on top I would get 6 times 0 plus 2 is 2 but I'd be dividing by zero. At this point, I'm hoping you know you can't divide by zero. Uh, anything divided by zero will make your calculator explode in your face. So just be careful with that. Okay, another example here, I've got a common denominator, but in this situation, because I'm subtracting and I'm subtracting a binomial, we have to put our binomial in brackets. And the reason for that is this subtraction sign is going to alter the sign of both of these terms. So because I have a common denominator, I can just subtract straight across. Remember putting that, that second binomial in brackets forces me to change the sign of each term. Okay, so this just leaves me with a similar situation as my previous example where I've got to collect my like terms. Right, so 5x and negative 3x, I'm going to collect those. I'll collect those two guys and I'll end up with a nice simplified expression like this. x equals negative 2 would make this blow up in your face. Remember you'd be dividing by 0 and that's not possible. I want to look at a couple examples where the denominators are not the same. Okay, but it's, it's exactly the same sort of situation as the second example we did during the warm-up. Okay, we're just going to try to find a common denominator between our two denominators, or in this case, our three denominators. We're just going to try to somehow change our expression so that all the denominators are the same. The first thing I need to do is look at my denominators. So I've got three, I've got four, and I've got six. Now, if you write out the multiples of three, four, and six, Eventually, you're going to see that 12 is common between all three of these numbers. So your goal is, is to somehow make each of these numbers equal to 12. Okay, and we do that by multiplying. So let's look at this first term here. What I'm going to do is multiply 3 times 4. Right, 3 times 4 will give me 12. Uh, and remember, that's my goal, is to make each of these numbers 12. But remember, I can't just multiply the denominator by 4. That's going to change my expression. If I multiply the top by 4... Right, if I were to just cancel this 4 over 4, I'd end up with my original expression, which is great. I haven't changed my expression in any way. Think of this as just creatively multiplying by 1. 
So I haven't changed my expression, but I've got now I've got 12 on the bottom. Same thing for the second expression. I've got 4 on the bottom. If I multiply by 3, I end up with 12. But I can't just multiply by 3 on the bottom. I've got to multiply on the top. And lastly, the same thing. I've got to take 6, multiply by 2. I also have to multiply by 2 on the top. Now we've got a nice set of common denominators. What I'm going to do next is just use the distributed property here. Distribute this 4 into the brackets. Same thing with the 3, same thing with the 2. So at this point, we're actually at the exact same spot as we were in the previous example, where we've got a set of common denominators. All we have to do is add straight across. But don't forget, put this guy in brackets, because that negative is going to affect the sign of each of those terms. Okay, so you should end up with something like this. Again, you've got like terms. Uh, I'm not going to circle them, but the x's are all like terms. The terms without an x are also a different set of like terms. So we can collect and end up with 5x plus 15 over 12. Interestingly enough, we do not have any restrictions on x, right? Reason being, we don't have an x in the denominator. So there's no way that this rational expression can blow up in our face. This is a safe rational expression. So this is going to be the exact same sort of process, but you can see here, instead of just numerical values in the denominator, like 3, 4, and 6, I've got a combination of a number and, and a variable with power. Okay, so taking a look, you can see the highest power on a is 3. So each of these terms should have a to the power of 3 in it. If I multiply this term by a, I'll end up with a cubed. Same thing here. If I multiply this term 2a squared by a, I'll end up with 2a cubed. Okay, but it's not enough just to have a cubed. I also have to somehow find a common denominator between the 5, the 2, and the 1 that's in front of a cubed. Okay, so thinking about multiples of 5 and 2, you'd see that 10 would be the lowest common denominator. So my goal here is to make these denominators have a 10 and an a cubed in them. What number can I multiply 5a squared by to get 10? And what variable can I multiply 5a squared by to get a cubed? So the answer for that one, it turns out, is 2a. So if I multiply 2a times 5a squared, I'd end up with 10a cubed. That satisfies both of my conditions of needing 10 and a cubed in my denominator. But remember, I have to do that on the top as well. You should be able to cancel these out nicely and end up with the exact same expression. And you can see here that that's the case. Right? So I have not changed my expression. Okay, same thing for the next term. I've got to multiply this guy by something to get me 10a cubed. So if you think, what number can I multiply 2 by to get 10? The answer would be 5. And I'd also need to multiply by an a so that I can end up with a cubed. Okay, and we end up with this expression. Lastly, to get 10a cubed on the bottom for this term, all I'd have to do is multiply by 10 over 10. If I were to just simplify my denominators, you would see here that they are all common. At this point, we're in the exact same situation as earlier when we had common denominators, and we could add straight across, and that's what we're going to do here. So just to simplify, writing these all in the, in the numerator, I end up with a nice simplified expression, stating that a can't be 0. Okay, one more quick example, probably the trickiest in this video. You can see here, instead of just monomials or numerical denominators, I've got a binomial in the denominator. This can get a little scary, but you're going to just apply that same concept of, of finding a common denominator between these two. Let's think about this. I've got an x minus 3 in this denominator. I've got an x plus 2 in this denominator. What I need to do is take x minus 3 and multiply by x plus 2. Okay, so if I do that, I'd end up with x plus 2 times x minus 3 in the denominator. Remember, I have to also multiply by x plus 2 on top. So that takes care of the first, the first expression. But what I also have to do is multiply the bottom of my second expression by the denominator of my first expression. That's the only way that I'm going to end up with a common denominator. And you can see here I've got a set of common denominators now. These are still common denominators. Remember, I could switch these and we'd end up with the same expression. In order to really clean this up nicely, I'm going to use the concept of FOIL to expand my brackets. So I'm going to do that for each set of binomials, including the ones in the denominator. A little bit of a mess, uh, but really all I've got here is just a bunch of like terms, right? I've got an x squared and an x squared. I've got a couple x terms, and then I've got a couple terms without an x. So really the next step just involves collecting my like terms. Once I collect my like terms, I end up with this expression here. 
Now, when it comes to stating your restrictions, you can see our denominator here, it's a little tough to see what would make this zero. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take a peek at this form of my expression before I simplified. And you can see here that if I were to substitute three in for x, I'd get zero on the bottom, right? So that's where this guy comes from. Likewise, if I substitute negative two, I would also get zero on the bottom. Okay, so just to state your restrictions, it's a good idea to look at your expression prior to simplifying.